Huling pitong wika, paghihimay sa mga makabuluhang mensahe ng Panginoong Heso Kristo sa Cruz. Laan ay pag-asa at kaligtasan sa sanlibutan. Nagpapatuloy po tayo sa ating Holy Week Special dito sa FEBC Philippines. Tampok ang pitong huling wika ng Panginoong Jesus noong unang-unang Biyernes Santo. Ito po ay naririnig sa iba't ibang mga himpilan ng radyo ng FEBC, AM and FM stations, pati na rin sa social media at sa GCTV Channel 185 sa Signal Cable. Kaya saan man kayo nando doon, sa Pilipinas man o sa ang bahagi ng mundo, um, We're happy na you can join us. Sana po ay maging tunay na makabuluhan para sa inyo ang inyong pag-spend ng panahon para subaybayan ang mga ito. Sa ikalawang wika ng ating Panginoong Yesus, ando doon yung assurance na I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. Yan po ay nasa Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Isang pangakong Inaasam-asam na marinig nating lahat. Today you will be with me in paradise. Sa isang piraso ng tabla na merong markang hari ng mga Hudyo sa krus ni Kristo. Ang purpose pala noon ay para hamakin si Kristo. Yung palang markang yon, yung parang sign na yon na ay um, parang medyo nangungot siya. Mm. Eh, uh, nagkiklaim na siya ay anak ng Diyos. Kung babasahin mo, parang, uy, hindi ba honoring yon Hindi eh. Um, ito'y translated sa tatlong wika sa Griego, na siyang great um, at language uh, ng lumang panahon. Nasa Hebreo din, ang lingwahe ng mga Israelita. At nasa Latin, para sa mga Romano. At uh, ito yung legal language. Para maintindihan ng lahat ang nang naroroon at yurakan din ang pagkatao ng nakapako doon sa krus na yon. Hmm. Pero ang himala rito ay mismo ang mensahe, no? ang mensaheng hari ng mga Hudyo. Yeah. Yung term na yon, no? ang nakapagbigay ng pag-asa sa magnanakaw mismo. Oo. No? Na nakapako rin kasabay ni Kristo. Sa pagitan ng buhay at kamatayan, sinabi niya, Jesus, adalahanin mo ako kapag ikaw ay nasa iyong kaharian na o naghahari na. At sa mga katagang ito, natamo niya ang kaligtasan. Pangakong nakapagbibigay sa atin ng, ng comfort, kaaliwan, at ng pag-asa. Lalo na sa mga nakararanas na uh, lamang sa buhay ng kawalan no? ng mga mahal sa buhay. Inalay ng magnanakaw ang buong niyang tiwala nang dahil sa tabla na malinaw No, na nagsasabing hari ng mga Hudyo. But of course, hindi lang sa tabla palagay ko dahil narinig din niya yung unang sambitla ng ating Panginoon. Hmm. Forgive them. Alam niya rin ang ugong. No, ang mga nabalitaan niya, hindi naman lingid sa pinangin ng mga tao nung araw oh. o nung ginawa ng ating Panginoon. Subalit, narinig niya mismo. Kaligtasan ng alok ng Panginoong Yesus sa mga taong lumalapit. Kumikilala sa Kanya. No, bilang Diyos at kumikilala sa Kanya bilang tagapagligtas, kapatawaran at buhay na walang hanggan. Sa araw na ito, I assure you, yeah. you will be with me in paradise. Napakaganda nun. Bishop, ang dami kong nababasa at naririnig na mga kumukot siya, nagbabash doon sa thief na yon. Mm. Ano? Hindi siya, w- wala siyang ginawa? Wala ang ginawa. Wala siyang... Uh, tinrabaho, hindi siya nag-aral, hindi siya inordain, hindi siya dumaan sa iba't iba mga normal na dinadaanan ng mga tao ngayon. And yet, he gets the same new life yes. na ngayon ay parang hirap na hirap ang mga tao ngayon uh, to, to, to realize. Pwede pala yun? And sana all. <laughs> oh, sana all. <laughs> Ganong kadali. And yet, yung pangako na you will be with me without hesitation napasa, mm-hmm. napasa kanya uh, yes. parang there's something there for us na hindi natin kailangan ng credits 
mga titulo, mga mm -hmm. diploma, certificates na dinaanan sa training, yes. but a heart that recognizes the Lordship of Christ. Yun bang uh, sinabi niyang alalahanin mo ako, remember me when you go to your kingdom. Abay, alam mo, napakarami ang ibig sabihin nun eh. You know, ibig sabihin ni eh, pare-pareho silang naroon sa krus at nagaantabay na sila'y mamatay. Pagkatapos, ang sabi niya eh, remember me. Hindi <laughs> ba? Isipin mo, no? Nagaantay na sila, nakapako na eh. Uh -oh. Hindi naman sila. Tapos, ang sabi, remember me. So, in fact, yung kanyang paningin kay Kristo ay lagpas doon sa moment mm -hmm. of death. No? At yung pagkilala niya sa kanya, no, bilang naghahari, lagpas sa moment of death. You know? At napakagandang isipin, lalo yung assurance na yan. Ayan. Ito pong mga um, paunang mga insights na naririnig niyo from us ay bunga ng napakaraming mga naririnig na rin namin. Pag-aaral, mga talakayan, mga pagbubulay-bulay, mga interactions. Pero ang gusto namin sana ay kayo'y magkaroon ng sarili ninyong mga reflections mm. din. Sa mga panahong katulad nito, Biyernes Santo. Ang broadcast pong ito ay isang ayon sa um, heart language. Ibig sabihin ay diretso sa puso mm. ng bawat isang naaabot ng aming mga salitang ito. Hindi lamang sa wika, kundi sa tamang kultura at kinaroroonan natin ang ating environment. Layo nitong broadcast nating ito na umabot sa lahat ng mga nakikinig. Sa Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, ang sabi rito, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Ito po ang inspirasyon kung bakit ang mga gawain ng FEBC on the air and online ay umaabot sa iba't ibang mga tao sa kanilang lengguahe, sa kanilang kultura at kapaligiran. Bawat tribo, bawat um, sektor ng lipunan na para ang wika ay hindi maging balakid sa pagkaunawa ng mensahe ng Diyos sa atin. Kaya, lagi po tayo may mga partner na experts. Lagi po sa FEBC, siguro napap napapansin ninyo, ay merong iba't ibang mga uh, level ng discussions. Um, mayroong mga nag-aaral uh, at nagpapayo, nagka-counseling, merong nag uh, sumasagot sa inyong mga Uh, pangangailangang tungkol sa kalusugan, uh, medical uh, topics, uh, mga concerns sa uh, legal sa batas, uh, biblical teachings and perspectives, at um, mga language missionaries. Uh, ito pong mga ito ay ginagawa namin upang makita natin na ang mensahe ng Panginoong Diyos ay hindi lamang pang loob ng simbahan. Mm. Ito ay humihipo sa lahat ng larangan ng buhay Um, integral yeah. um, swak sa anumang bahagi ng buhay natin na ang mensahe ng Diyos. So, hindi po ito pang religious discussions lang, mm -hmm. pang Sunday school, pang uh, preaching sa pulpito. Hindi po ito pang talakayan uh, ng uh, mga marurunong sa Biblia. Ito po ay nandoon din sa level ng mga kabataang hindi malaman kung saan pupunta nalulung sa droga, nakakaroon ng indecision tungkol sa karir na pinupuntahan, pupuntahan na. Ito ay gusto namin makaabot sa inyo, hindi lamang sa lingwahe, kundi sa level ng inyong ginagalawana sa kasalukuyan. Kaya sama rin po ninyo ang mga gumagawa ng mga programang ito sa inyong panalangin. Na sila ay mag attempt lagi na abutin ang bawat nakikinig doon sa mundong kanilang ginagalawan. Communicating Christ in our world. Mm -mm. Ang level at uh, degree ng komunikasyon, actually, eh, friend, ay merong kalalagyan. Eh. Mm -hmm. you know? eh, pag, nag, pag naghain ka ng masarap na pagkain sa isang taong busog, <laughs> hindi naman yan. 
Papansin yun. Gusto po. Wala siyang ganang kumain. Oo. Oh, oh. Pero pag gutom yan, nako, sinabi ko sa inyo, kahit hindi masarap. Oo. Oh, oh. oh. Eh, Ubus. ibig sabihin, we cater to uh, people, ano man ang kanilang kalalagyan, upang ang mensahe ay, tama yung sinata mo, swak. Okay. <laughs> swak na swak sa bawat kalalagyan. Okay. <laughs> oh. Kaagapay, nais mo bang lumapit sa Panginoong Jesus? Halika, manalangin. No? At uh, tanggapin mo si Kristo, anumang kalalagyan mo sa buhay. No? Siya'y nabayubay sa krus. Sapagkat sa kanyang pagkabayubay, yun ay, ang pinakadahilan nun ay yung ating kalalagyan. Eh. Hmm. At ang nagdala sa atin sa ating kalalagyan, eh ang kasalanan. Tawa tayo mga, yung ating pagkakasala, yan ang nagdulot sa atin sa ating kalalagyan. Ngunit siya, ay nag-alay ng kanyang sarili at nabuhay siya upang palagi tinan natin siyang buhay. Eh, isipin mo, yung nagsabing uh, magnanakaw sa Panginoon, eh, alalahanin mo ako. Sinabi niya yun, eh, beyond no, the point of death. Kaya po, eh, may pag-asa kay Kristo. Alika, sundin mo yung panalangin na ito. No? We only need to admit na hindi natin maliligtas ang ating sarili sapagkat tayo'y pawang mga makasalanan. Gawin mong panalangin ito. Okay? Papamunahan lang kita. Panginoong Diyos, Maraming salamat sa iyong pag-ibig. Maraming salamat sa iyong dakilang pagpapatawan. Kinikilala ko, Panginoon, sa pamamagitan ng pananampalataya. Ang sinabi sa iyong salita, Ikaw ay umibig, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Panginoong Jesus, kinikilala ko na Ikaw nga ay namatay sa krus ng Kalbaryo para sa akin. Ikaw ay namatay ngunit na buhay na mag-uli upang maging buhay ko. Kaya Panginoong Diyos, Panginoong Jesus, kinikilala ko ang aking pagiging makasalanan. Ikaw ang kailangan ko. Ikaw ang aking maging tagapagligtas. Kung paanong sinabi ng magnanakaw na alalahanin mo ako, alalahanin mo ako, Panginoong Jesus. Tinatanggap kita sa aking puso bilang aking tagapagligtas at Panginoon ng buhay ko. Tinatanggap ko ang lahat ng ginampanan mo para sa akin, ang kapatawaran at ang iyong pag-alok na sa pagtanggap ko sa iyo, ako ay magiging related sa iyo. Ang iyong buhay ay magiging buhay ko. Kaya tinatanggap ko ang buhay na walang hanggan na tanging ikaw lamang ang pinanggagalingan. Ikaw ay manahan sa aking buhay. Manahan kat ikaw ang maging Panginoon, maging tagapagligtas at Panginoon ng buhay ko. Maraming salamat sa pagpapatawad. Maraming salamat sa assurance na ako ay sa iyo at sa iyo pipiling. Sa pangalan ni Kristo Jesus. Amen. Amen. Kung pinanalangin mo yan, yan ang panalangin ng pagtanggap sa pamamagitan ng pananampalataya. Napaka laki, napaka significant itong milestone na ito sa buhay mo. Kung yun ay ginawa mo, um, sinundan mo si Bishop sa kanyang pananalangin, But please let us know. Uh, maganda makarinig ng kung ano yung inyong naging karanasan sa pag-respond sa paanyaya ng ating Panginoong Yesus. Papakinggan po natin ang pag-aaral, pagbubulay-bulay sa ikalawang wika ng ating Panginoong Yesus doon sa Cruz ng Kalbaryo. Ito po'y manggagaling naman mula kay Pastor James Brenner Chu. Siya po naman ay mula sa Pilgrim Community Church. International Presbyterian Church Pastor Chu
ang mahalagang pamana sa makabagong panahon mula sa paghimay sa ikalawa sa huling pitong wikang binitawan ng Panginoong Heso Kristo sa Krus ng Kalbaryo kasama si Pastor James Briner Chu. What comes to your mind when you hear the word paradise? A beautiful tropical beach resort? A cozy log cabin high up in the snowy mountains? If you're not much of an outdoorsy person, perhaps paradise might evoke a day with friends within the safety, comforts, and conveniences of a highly urbanized city. We all have different ideas of what paradise might be, but I think the common denominator to all of our visions of paradise is that paradise is, or ought to be, a place of unbounded happiness. What is more, I suspect that for most of us, our ideas of paradise as a happy place are largely dependent on the kind of company that we imagine ourselves to be with. As relational beings, we humans instinctively understand that our enjoyment of the good things in life is multiplied by the good company that we get to enjoy them with. When we turn our attention to the original paradise sanctuary that the Bible speaks about, the Garden of Eden that God himself planted at the beginning of creation. We realize that what made this garden special was not so much that it was filled with fruit-bearing trees of every sort or that it had the perfect climate and environment for life to thrive in. Rather, what made this special garden a paradise was that it was a place where God was present. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, were placed in the Garden of Eden in order that they might enjoy unending fellowship and communion with God, their Heavenly Father. There, in the Garden Paradise of Eden, they enjoyed the truly blessed life of holiness and happiness for which God had made them. Now, as we reflect on this garden paradise that God had planted in the region of Eden, we soon realize that the garden was actually situated on top of God's original holy mountain. We can easily miss this. But that great river that watered the garden cues us to this fact. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, we read that a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. The picture is that of a fountain of living water flowing downstream from the peak of the mountain in order to irrigate and to enliven the rest of the land. A beginning from the top of the mountain where the garden was, we could discern a threefold structure. The garden sanctuary at the top, the surrounding, surrounding region of Eden that was watered by the downward flow of the river, and the rest of the earth. Now, we will remember, too, from Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, that when God had made man, he blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Adam and Eve's original task was to populate 
not only the garden, not only the region of Eden, but the whole earth. The whole earth. As people who were made in the image of God and for his glory, the task of Adam, the task of all of humanity in him, was to expand God's garden paradise to include the whole region up to the ends of the earth. As the prophet Habakkuk would later declare, God's desire was that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, unfortunately, Adam was neither able to remain long in God's garden paradise, nor was he able to fulfill God's charge to him to extend the limits of God's garden paradise to the ends of the earth. Adam disobeyed God's clear command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As a, pep, as a, as a public man, his sin had mortal consequences, not only for himself, but for all of humanity in him. As an old New England alphabet textbook puts it, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. And consequently, Adam and Eve were banished from God's garden paradise. And at the entrance to this holy sanctuary, God placed angels called cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. And the message is clear, isn't it? The message is, Adam will never again return to God's garden paradise except by going under the sword. The story of Adam and Eve would have ended in complete tragedy and catastrophe had it not been for God's mercy and grace. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in the context of God's pronouncement of judgment against the serpent who tempted our first parents, God declared what Christians have long recognized as the first ever announcement of the gospel in all of the Bible. Let me read it to you. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right here, right here in this one pivotal verse in the story of humanity, God made the promise that one day a son will come from the line of the woman in order to completely destroy the wicked serpent. In that cosmic contest between good and evil, the woman's seed will suffer some damage. But in the end, he will triumph. The promised seed of the woman will trample the serpent's head underfoot. It is a decisive victory. This Genesis promise finds its ultimate fulfillment in the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we turn now to reflect on these words of the Lord as he hung on the cross, we need to bear in mind that all this was happening in fulfillment of God's ancient promise of good news, which was announced soon 
after man's fall. To see Jesus, to picture Jesus on the cross is to recognize God's faithfulness. Luke chapter 23, verse 43 reads, And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The first thing that we must note here is to whom Jesus was speaking these words. We will remember that there were two other men, convicted criminals who were being put to death along with Jesus. The contrast between Jesus and these two other men could not have been more stark. Here was Jesus. He who knew no sin, but whom God was making sin for our sakes, flanked on either side by cursed criminals who were being justly executed because of their sins, because of their crimes. And these two criminals had two very opposite ways of seeing and talking to Jesus. The first one, apparently emboldened by the mockery and insults hurled at the Lord by the local rulers and some of the soldiers, chimed in with his own incredulity. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal, on the other side of Jesus, saw things very differently. It would seem that God's grace had opened his spiritual eyes to see the reality that this man in the middle, this Jesus, was not guilty like him and the other criminal. And so he speaks out. The words he utters flow from a heart that in spite of his past sins and crimes, was beginning to recognize that the crucified man beside him was actually suffering unjustly for sins that he did not commit. Listen to what he says. Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And Jesus said, and to Jesus he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's in Luke chapter 23, verses 40 to 42. Whereas the first criminal mockingly challenged Jesus to save the three of them from temporal suffering, this second criminal saw and believed that Jesus was able to save him to the uttermost. He believed that Jesus was the conquering king who was establishing his people in his glorious kingdom through his decisive victory over all of their enemies. The salvation that Jesus brings is not only one that merely delays physical death. The salvation that Jesus brings is one that saves sinners from the interruption of death and onwards onwards to everlasting life in God's paradise and glory. As the long-promised serpent crusher, Jesus had come as the second and last Adam in order to stamp out completely the terrors of sin, Satan, and secularism. As a public man, 
Jesus' triumph extends to, to all who would turn to him. With eyes of faith, the second criminal who hung beside him looked to Jesus hopingly. And so it is to this second criminal that Jesus spoke these words of promise. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now what does this teach us? It teaches us that Jesus' promise is for criminals too. In the grand scheme of things, all of us who naturally descend from Adam share in his crime and in his sin. Remember, in Adam's fall, we sin all. As sinners, we are all rebels and criminals in the sight of God. But the good news is this. If the second criminal could be saved through simple faith in the Lord Jesus, then you and I too could be saved. If grace were accessible even to this criminal at the very end of his life, a life of crime, then the promise of grace must be for us also. Indeed, it is for all who would repent of their sins and put their trust in Jesus alone to save them. The salvation that Jesus brings is for all sorts of sinners who would trust in his name. Now, the second thing that we could learn from Jesus' words of assurance to this criminal is the promise of his comforting company. Today, Jesus tells him, you will be with me in paradise. As we have reflected earlier, what truly completes the idea of paradise is the kind of company that we have in our enjoyment of it. Now, Jesus does not say to the criminal, today you will be in paradise. Rather, he says, today you will be with me. And if Jesus says this to us, does the question of where really matter? It doesn't. It matters little where we find ourselves as long as Jesus promises to be with us. Wherever Jesus is, there is paradise. To be with Jesus is to be in paradise. It is enough to be with our beloved, the one who loves our soul. The place is irrelevant. Paradise is where we could be with the Lord forever. But let's pause for a little bit and let's think back to the Garden of Eden, that paradise sanctuary that Adam, by his fall, had forfeited. What is perhaps most remarkable about Adam and Eve's banishment from God's presence is that the entrance to the gate was not removed, but only barred. At the entrance to the garden, God placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. There was still a way back, but the entrance into paradise will not be opened. It will be impossible to enter except through the fatal slash of a sword. We've already mentioned that the original holy mountain of the Lord had a threefold structure. The garden at the top, the surrounding region of Eden, and the rest of the earth. Later, when God brought the people of Israel in their exodus from Egypt to Mount Sinai in the wilderness, 
we again see this same threefold structure. Only Moses was allowed to ascend to the very top of the mountain. The elders of the people were allowed only to the middle part of Sinai. And the rest of the people of Israel were permitted to stay only in the region beyond the foot of the mountain. And later still, when God gives instructions to Moses for the construction of the tabernacle tent, it appears that this threefold structure is again repeated, moving from the innermost section outwards. There was the most holy place, the holy place, and the tabernacle court. It was as if the tabernacle in the wilderness was meant to serve as a mountain put on its side, a portable mountain of the Lord. The whole structure was meant to be a visible and tangible representation of God's presence with His tent-dwelling people. In this way, the memory and longing for a paradise lost is signified to the believers in the Old Testament through the tabernacle. God was in their midst, but it was not the same as it was for our first parents in the garden. It was possible to approach God but only by way of the very exact ritual of sacrifices and ceremonies for purification. Indeed, just as with Moses and Sinai, the most holy place in the tabernacle was only to be entered into once a year. On the annual Day of Atonement, the high priest of Israel having purified himself and the people, appears before the presence of the Lord in the most holy place to offer sacrifice. That the high priest, in venturing to do this, is not consumed by the fire of God's holy wrath is a testament to God's abiding mercy and promise. And what was that promise? God had promised that one day a son will come from the woman in order to crush the head of the serpent. One day God will make a full return to the paradise garden of Eden possible. Curiously, David, the psalmist, reflects this same memory, this same longing for God's temple, mountain, garden, paradise. We can read this in the 24th Psalm when he writes, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. That's from Psalm 24, verses 1 to 4. Friends, paradise was lost due to the sin of the first Adam. Because of his fall, no sinner can now lay claim to the right to ascend the holy mountain of the Lord. Just as the Garden of Eden was guarded by cherubim 
and a flaming sword, so too was the sanctuary of the most holy place in the tabernacle closed off by a very thick curtain. Because on the curtain, there was a design. Cherubim were worked into it. In Exodus chapter 26, verses 31 and 33, we read, these were the instructions on constructing the tabernacle. And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place and the most holy place. We could easily miss the significance of all of this unless we realize what happens to this veil at the moment of Jesus' death on the cross. Recording that very moment, Matthew the evangelist writes, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Uh, this is very significant. Matthew reports that at the moment of Jesus' death, the curtain of the temple, the same veil that was meant to separate the most holy place and the holy place, that same curtain into which the cherubim was skillfully worked, was torn into from top to bottom. Now, tears usually start from the bottom up, but this curtain was torn from top to bottom. It would almost seem as if someone had taken a sword to it and slashed it from top to bottom in one fell sweep. Now, what does this all mean? What does the death of Christ mean for sinners like us? It means that the way into the most holy place is now opened up. The entrance to God's paradise sanctuary is now once more open and able to welcome wayward sinners home. The river of life which flows from the top of God's holy mountain is now unstopped and its cool springs can now refresh and enliven weary souls again through the saving work of Christ. Did not Jesus himself say this? shortly before his arrest. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 38. Returning to Jesus' words to the second criminal, we read, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It is paradise enough to be with Jesus where he is. It is even more glorious that by his death, he again opens the way back into God's sanctuary. By his death, Jesus went under the sword of God's wrath for sin in order that he might bring all of his people home. This included this believing criminal. This also includes all who, along with him, Come to Jesus with empty hands and believing hearts, saying, Jesus, remember me. The psalmist's remembering and longing questions, who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? These find their decisive answer in the redemptive death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. He is the one who has never lifted up his soul to what is false. He is the one who has never sworn deceitfully. He is the one in whose presence and company is paradise. He is the one who makes entrance back into paradise possible. Now, the last thing that we need to note about Jesus' words to the second criminal is the enduring significance of his words. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And Jesus says to the criminal today, he does not say soon or later or next week or some indefinite time in the future. No, the promise is today 
It is now. It is this present moment. To believe in Jesus is to be forever and inseparably united to Him by faith. The effect is immediate. The reality is instant. There's nothing more that the believing criminal needs to do to earn paradise. Indeed, there is nothing that he could have done. God alone must and can save. Dear friends, this is grace. It is undeserved favor from God. And the good news is that for all who sincerely repent of their sins, who forsake all feeble human attempts to earn God's favor, who humbly put their trust in Jesus alone to save them and to bring them into God's paradise, today is the day of salvation. Perhaps this is you. Perhaps you too yearn for the memory and longing of a lost paradise. Jesus' words of promise are for you if you would put yourself in the place of the second criminal. If you repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus alone, if you would see him and his presence as the paradise that you have been longing for in your heart of hearts, if you desire the forgiveness for sins that only he can give, then say to him even now, Jesus, remember me. My friend, if this is the prayer of your heart, then know this. Jesus' promise of his own presence as paradise is yours. Even now, to you, he addresses these words. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You may still have many days left to your life here on earth, or you may already be at the, at the sunset of your life. It doesn't really matter. If you believe in Jesus, then today you already are with Him in paradise. One day when He returns, He will make all things new. And then our experience of the paradise of His presence will be even more glorious. This is our blessed hope as followers of Jesus. By faith, this is the unending life of holiness and happiness to which we must look. God bless you all.